Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. In this video today I want to tease out some of Keats's paradoxical thinking and imagery that he uses throughout the poetry of 1819, that great year of his composition where he wrote many, many, many of his great poems, including the Great Odes and Eva St Agnes uh, and other poems as well. And I'm going to start with a quick literary background to the poem Bright Star, and particularly I want to think about the image of the cold, steadfast star watching the human sphere from a distance. And to do this, I'm going to look at a letter of John Keats's to his brother, Tom Keats. Um, and I'm also going to look at a poem by William Wordsworth, who Keats absolutely revered William Wordsworth, um, in many ways, although he disliked some of uh, Wordsworth's other qualities. But um, I'm going to look at The Excursion, which was a poem that Keats very much admired. And I'm going to think about the romantic poetic sublime and Keats's response to the romantic um, poetic sublime. I'm going to draw on a couple of other poems by John Keats too, which were also written in 1819 so that we can see the development of Keats's thinking. So primarily um, on Ode on a Grecian Urn, and I'm going to also draw on Ode on Melancholy. And I'm going to highlight the central paradox um, in, within Keats's thinking that I think is also relevant to the poem Bright Star. That is Keats's working through or trying to reconcile the ideas of the cold eternal and the warm human. And the Keatsian idea almost sort of oxymoronically of experiencing at the same time. So simultaneously experiencing two seemingly contradictory feelings or experiences or states. So for example, for example, within the same moment, experiencing pleasure and melancholy. I'm very briefly going to look at the form of the poem Bright Star, so it's a mixture of Petrarchan and Shakespearean sonnet form, um, and think about how the poem's form helps inform or helps us to understand the poem's meaning. And then I'm going to um, move on and close read and analyse the poem Bright Star in detail. So as you may well have been able to tell from this introduction, today's video is going to be discursive in nature because I want to focus on the conceptual side of Keats's poetry and Keats's thinking. So focus on the ideas that he's playing with, think about the questions he's asking rather than trying to suggest any kind of answers or um, suggest the, the, any resolutions that he comes to. Keats's poetry is not about settling on resolutions, often it's about uh, probing and about continuing and not settling. So he talks about, um, or one of his central ideas is about being content to exist in a state of uncertainty and many of his poems close in that way. You might think of the end of Ode to a Nightingale, for example, which ends on a question. So to start, I'm just going to read through the poem Bright Star. Bright Star, would I were as steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendour hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient sleepless eremite. The moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, to feel forever its soft swell and fall, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death. So to start then with some background and literary uh, context to the poem. So 
A few years before The Poem Bright Star was written, we think it was written in October to December 1819, although there's some debate about that, but assuming it's written in October to December 1819. A few years before that, uh, Keats had written to his brother Tom Keats um, on the 25th to the 27th of June 1818. This is when he was going on a walking tour of the Lake District and he was kind of recording his thoughts and feelings um, in a in a journal letter type uh, situation that he was writing to his, his brother. Now, Tom Keats died of tuberculosis, uh, also known as consumption, in December of that year, so in December 1818. So about a year, less than a year, before Bright Star was written. And as I, as I read through the poem, this idea of death, particularly in the poetry of 1819 for Keats, is really an ever, ever presence. He, you know, nursed his brother. He was a physician. He was an, um, a trained apothecary. Keats, John Keats was, and he trained, uh, he nursed his brother through his, his dying. Um, and reflected back obviously on their love for each other and so on in the year after Tom Keats had died. And indeed consumption tuberculosis would be the, the thing that would go on then to kill John Keats uh, only a few years later in February 1821. But during this walking tour in the Lake District, he's, John Keats is describing his feelings uh, and writing them to his brother. He's walking about in the Lake District and obviously that is the home of William Wordsworth, the great poet of the period, the great romantic poet, William Wordsworth, who was a poetic hero of John Keats's at the time. So this is what Keats, John Keats wrote to his brother. Two views we had of it. This is of Lake Windermere, which is one of the famous lakes of the Lake District. The two views we had of it, Lake Windermere, are of the most noble tenderness. They can never fade away. They make one forget the divisions of life, age, youth, poverty and riches, and refine one's sensual vision into a sort of North Star, which can never cease to be open-lidded and steadfast over the wonders of the great power. So here we have an image of the steadfast, open-lidded, open-eyed star that's gazing on the wonders of the great power. So um, one of the central ideas of romanticism is an idea that God kind of exists within nature and part of the sublimity of nature is because it's a kind of expression of the great power. It's kind of religious, um, divine, great power. And for Keats here, he's sort of imagining that looking down at Lake Windermere, he is essentially like this, um, like this steadfast star, that, the, that his vision is so kind of refined that it becomes like this gazing star. And you can see perhaps how this same image then comes up later, is still kind of percolating in Keats's mind and comes up later in the poem Bright Star. But um, also in mind, he has the poet's Wordsworth. So perhaps because he is in the lakes, which is obviously the home of William Wordsworth, that brought, inevitably, I think it must, it couldn't not if you were in the Lake District at this time, and at this time, Keats writes in his letters about being kind of desperate to meet Wordsworth. Um, and you can see that Wordsworth is in Keats's thinking here. Um, Keats especially revered Wordsworth's poem, The Excursion, which was published in 1814. And in fact, he had twice called the poem one of the three things to rejoice at in this age. So in the Romantic period, when all this kind of wonderful literary work is coming together, the pinnacle you many think of English literary history, there are others, of course, but, um, you know, this real period when, um, you know, great spirits now on earth are sojourning, they, they kind of recognised that it was a great moment in literary history. And even at this time, this poem, The Excursion, is one of the three things to rejoice at in this age. 
So he'd said that in January 1818, so about six months before he um, wrote this letter to Tom Keats. So the other two things, just in case you're interested, are William Hazlitt's depth of taste as a literary critic um, and also the paintings of uh, Benjamin Robert Hayden, who was a friend of Keats's. Uh, and in fact, painted the picture that is in the thumbnail to this, uh, to this video. Um, so in the excursion, William Wordsworth had written a similar image of a steadfast star. So this is in book four. Chaldean shepherds ranging trackless fields beneath the concave of unclouded skies spread like a sea. In boundless solitude looked on the polar star. The polar star is the same as the north star, uh, the pole star, uh, the bright star as on a guide and guardian of their course that never closed his steadfast eye. So we've got the steadfast eye of the star, the North Star, the Pole Star, the Bright Star. Um, but Keats also in the poem Bright Star can sort of converts the shepherds looking to the star and describing the solitude of the shepherd looking at the star to the reverse. So the star gazing on the world and the solitude and loneliness of the star. So in Wordsworth's poem, it's the shepherds who are in boundless solitude. And in Keats's bright star, it's the star that's in boundless solitude. And the, the human who's looking at the star is, is not wanting solitude, is wanting connection, is wanting um, togetherness with his lover. So just to read through then the lines that I think are, are relevant here, it's the opening quatrain, the opening four lines. Bright star, would I were as steadfast as thou art. So that's Wordsworth. Um, looked on the polar star that never closed his steadfast eye. Not in lone splendour hung aloft the night. So converting the star into um, the, the epitome of boundless solitude and watching with eternal lids apart. And here we go back to Keats's letter, North Star, which can never cease to be open lidded and steadfast. Like nature's patient, sleepless eremite. And we have in Wordsworth's poem, you can see the kind of typical, you might say, uh, idea of romantic, sublime, uh, poetic language. These concave of unclouded skies, you know, sort of sublimely, wondrously above humanity who are looking at it, spread like a sea. These are great, huge, big, grand images that Wordsworth is drawing on. Um, to describe the scene here. And Keats picks up on this in the early stages of Bright Star, you could say that nature's patient, sleepless eremite and talking of the earth and the star who looks at the earth's moving waters. Um, so similarly, like Wordsworth talking about um, the, the shepherds being spread like the sea, drawing on these huge, huge images to um, try and express the grandeur and the significance and the profundity of the thoughts that you are having. So I think this extract from Wordsworth's poem encapsulates what John Keats and Romanticism more generally had, had found profound in Wordsworth's poetry and um, what, what um, to some extent you can say is very, um, is, mm, captures really first generation romantic poetry. So if you think of Keats and uh, his, the poets of his generation, so Percival Shelley, Lord Byron, etc., the second generation romantics, they have a slightly different idea of nature from the first generation romantics. First generation romantics are uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Wordsworth, those who were alive um, earlier in the 18th century and lived through the first waves of the French Revolution, etc. And William Wordsworth in particular had this very um, sublime 
idea of nature and that's what we often think of when we talk about romantic ideas of nature but the second generation much of their poetry is about questioning first generation romantics idea of nature and that's exactly what's going on here when you compare the uh, excursion by Wordsworth and to some extent Keats's response to that same imagery in the poem Bright Star and in fact you can see more generally the poem Bright Star as as rejecting perhaps what is encapsulated in the first half of the poem in the octet which is about um, seeing this sublime image of the bright star and wanting then in the sestet in the second half of the sonnet to say no no I, I don't want that kind of uh, sublime detached steadfastness to describe my love I want something more intimate um, and so on but we'll get there when we look at the poem in a bit more detail so go to think then about uh, the words worthy and sublime so um, the words worthy and appreciation of sublime nature that you can see in this extract here almost sort of strips the human from the shepherds there's no sense really of them being individual people with their own private passions and thoughts they are chaldean shepherds ranging trackless fields you know spread like the sea beneath this huge um unclouded sky who are looking at the star and that star never closes his eyes on them great huge sublime imagery but nothing to do with the with those people at all the people the humanity has been kind of removed from that image so Wordsworth shepherds are in boundless solitude but Keats when he describes his shepherds in 1819 in his poetry of that great year we might think of the warm panting shepherd lovers in Odes on a Grecian Urn for example so Keats in the letter had written that this view had made him refine one sensual vision into a sort of North Star which can never cease. And this is one of the central paradoxes, conundrums that Keats is dealing with in 1819 after the death of his brother with the growing of his love for Fanny Braun, who the poem Bright Star is about but there's some contention about whether it's actually about her as it might be about someone else it might have been written slightly earlier but nevertheless he at least revised it to be about Fanny Braun but that you know they couldn't be together for various reasons and Keats is kind of dealing with all these in 1819 the death of his brother his love for this woman his growing love for this woman who he feels that he can't be with and you know that and Keats was a, a kind of hot tempered sort of a person anyway and yet so you have you have these kind of hot feelings that he's experiencing in the sadness and the grief and so on and you have a a type of poetry that is celebrated in the per period so the Wordsworthy type of poetry that is celebrated in the period which is about kind of cold distant sublime nature kind of removed and above humanity and Keats doesn't find that a sat satisfactory way to try and um, provide images for what he wants to describe um, and so in the letter so before Bright Star a cu you know a year and a half or so before he wrote Bright Star in the letter Keats seems to be accepting the Wordsworthian way of thinking about a human interaction with nature. So he, a human, looks on this view and kind of converts it into a cold, distant vision. So the warm human, the sensual, his sensual vision is refined, is converted into a cold, distant almost priest-like vision refine one sensual vision into a sort of north star which can never cease and i think the diction 
that Keats uses here, refine, is important because it means kind of purify and distill and intensify. But in doing so, of course, it leaves out other aspects of the of the vision. It leaves out the impurities. It leaves out the imperfections. And one of the imperfections that it seems to leave out is ceasing or dying. The North Star, Keats writes, which can never cease. So this idea of timelessness and eternity and continuing seems to be being represented here as being a positive, as being comforting in some sense. So moving on then to think about how this relates to the poem Bright Star, instead of converting the human into that cold uh, vision of the North Star, which, which never ceases to be, Keats seems to have developed his thinking by the time he gets to the poem Bright Star, and instead he wants to, to find a sense of the sublime, so the idea of that wonder and awe within small, private, intimate, human moments with all their imperfections, including ceasing to be. So one of the questions it seems to me that Keats is asking in the poem is what language and imagery should a poet use to convey the wonder or sublimity of a small human transitory moment. It's a problem for writers um, and for poets especially that by the Romantic period there was a poetic language established, the words worthy and kind of poetic la language established which you could say perhaps was a hangover from um, John Milton's Paradise Lost and the epic grandeur of that. But in the Romantic period you have a, a, a poetic language for conveying epic grandeur, contemporary language for co for um, conveying contemporary epic grandeur, you know, but that, that the Lake District is, is a sort of subject matter that you can say profound things about and you can describe the sublimity of your vision of nature when you look at the Lake District, for example. And you can see that in such poems as Wordsworth's The Excursion. But what if you want to convey a sense of epic significance, if not epic grandeur, about a fleeting human experience? What if a, something in your life is as profound as Lake Windermere, the vision of Lake Windermere, what language do you use? Because does the language of epic grandeur describing sublime, ro romantic sublime nature work when you're trying to talk about a, a little tiny human moment? So I think the whole of the Bright Star poem is about wrestling with wanting essentially those two things at once. So wanting the cold, distant, eternal and the language that you might use to describe that epic sublimity and the, the warm, intense human that is by nature transitory, that must cease. So to, to sort of think about this a bit more and tease this out a little bit more, I'm going to compare some of the central ideas I think there are in Bright Star um, to two other poems of John Keats's that were written slightly earlier in 1819, that is in about May 1819, a few months before we think the poem Bright Star was composed. Um, so I'm going to look at Ode on a Grecian Urn uh, and also Ode on Melancholy and I think they help draw each other out. So I want to show John Keats's continued thinking and how it develops and progresses and he's obviously wrestling with the same concerns during that great year of composition for him, 1819. So, Ode on a Grecian Urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, 
sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. So again, we've got this idea of kind of eternity and permanence. We've got the, the urn that is a foster child of silence and slow time, timelessness. It exists, you know, metaphorically for an eternity, even if, of course, an urn <laughs> won't actually exist forever, but still there's a kind of symbolically, it has existed throughout generations. So it's the opposite of a kind of intense moment of passion. But even from the opening, there is a sense that there is some unease. Thou still unravished bride of quietness. And I'll get on to why that should unsettle us from the beginning um, a little bit later. So what leaf-fringed leaf legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in temp or the dales of Arcady? So the speaker here, the narrative voice, is asking the urn, what are you, what's described on you? What are the kind of details and pictures that are described on the outside of the urn? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath, what mad pursuit, what struggle to escape, what pipes and timbrels, what wild ecstasy. So what's depicted on the urn is the wild ecstasy of human passion. So the mad pursuit of love, and you can think of the pastoral here with the shepherd figure, the piping shepherd, who's chasing his shepherdess lover in wild pursuit in mad ecstasy. So this this real kind of human intensity is depicted on the outside of this permanent urn. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. So the speaker here is thinking to himself, I'm going to assume it's a he, heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. So it's, as I was talking about earlier in Keats's letter to his brother, it's about the idea of converting the sensual, so the human sensual, into something else. So here, the actual heard melody, so the sense of hearing is, is sweet, but it's not as sweet, it's not as pleasurable as imagining what the figures on the urn are piping. So the imagine so kind of imagining what those shepherds are piping is more sweet than it would be actually to hear some piping. So the speaker says, you know, I'm going to carry on imagining what is being played, ye soft pipes play on, these these imagined pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, so not actually to my real human experience, but to the spirit ditties of no tone, to my imagination. Fair youth, beneath the trees, thou canst not leave. So he's now talking to the, the youth, the shepherd, on the urn, who's depicted on the urn, lying beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. So it's kind of um, solidifying this moment forever because the trees can never be bare. There can be no change here. The trees will always be full of leaves. Bold lover, never never canst thou kiss though winning near the goal that means you're just about to kiss the shepherd is just about to kiss the shepherdess always always just about to kiss the shepherdess is in this kind of pitch of emotion in this high you know beautiful moment of emotion this shepherd is caught forever and the the speaker of the poem is saying my god isn't that wonderful to be there forever to be just about to kiss your lover forever isn't that wouldn't that just be the most amazing uh thing to be like that forever because um do not grieve for she cannot fade so she can't die <laughs> She can't decay, she cannot fade. She'll stay like that forever as well. Though thou hast not thy bliss. 
So even even though this is suggested as being wonderful, at the same time, there's still the idea coming in that you don't actually have any bliss then. Um, though thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love and she be fair. So it's again this idea of eternity and wanting to keep that love alive for eternity. And this, it seems to the speaker of this poem, this is a way to do that because these lovers are encapsulated on this urn forever and so she cannot fade and forever wilt thou love and she be fair, forever. And we'll see when we get on to looking a bit more at Bright Star, the idea of forever comes very much into uh, Bright Star as indeed does the idea of still, um, which relates to. And then we move into the third stanza. And I always think of this stanza as being a bit like the lady doth protest too much. Just how many times can the speaker say happy, 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 happy. It's really over egging the pudding. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves. Again, this idea of eternity and not being able to die. You cannot die. You cannot shed your leaves. You cannot decay, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist unwearied. You know that this, the, the, the figure piper can pipe forever and never get tired of it. Forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed. Forever warm and still to be enjoyed. Doesn't that just sound wonderful? The speaker is suggesting. Forever panting and forever young. All breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed a burning forehead and a parching tongue. So here the speaker is saying that this state of a sort of suspended animation that the people on the urn are in, that they're forever happy, forever warm and still to be enjoyed. And in a way that is a purer or a better love than real life love with breathing human passion that it's far above that because real love is never always that happy, um, in, in never always that um, forever panting and forever young, forever warm and still to be enjoyed because real life human, breathing human passion leaves a heart sorrowful, high sorrowful and cloyed and it gives you a headache, a, a burning forehead and a parching tongue, you know, that it leaves you kind of um, uncomfortable and in pain sometimes. Whereas the speak, the um, figures on the urn are unwearied. They never get tired. The final stanza begins, O attic shape, fair attitude. And we might think of this as commenting on actually the kind of performative uh, nature of these figures on the urns actually that they're only in an attitude so back in the 18th century attitudes were a kind of acting style that you would um, get into a particular attitude and that would convey some feeling and then you get you sort of get into another attitude and that would convey a different feeling and it's drawing on that idea that these are just in the um, shape of describing a feeling and actually maybe they're just that <laughs> maybe it's just a kind of surface position it's human all breathing human passion far above so what is something that's above breathing human passion maybe it's just the shape of a pair of lovers rather than everything that comes with all the impurities of breathing human passion. 
So, O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought. And there's a little little joke there that um, the the emotions of the carrot men and ma the men and maidens on the urn are overwrought because they're overcome with emotion. But also the urn is itself, or th those figures on the urn are overwrought because they're wrought, they're um, made, they're constructed over the urn. Of, mar of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity cold pastoral. So in this poem then, the speaker admits or realises that thinking about all this stuff teases him out of thought. That he sort of thinks about it so much and goes over it and over it and over it again that it gets to a point where he can't really think at all. You know, it teases you out of thought because you go over it and over it and over it and then it becomes so kind of knotty that you can't see the wood for the trees. And that's the same idea that he has. So this idea of um, how do you how do you hold on to a fleeting moment of human passion what's the best way to keep it because a transitory human moment if it's transitory then it, it's died it's gone it's decayed and what if you don't want to let it go what if you want to keep hold of it how do you do that and that's what this poem is thinking through that silent form though so the urn you're teasing me out of thought and that's the same also with the idea of eternity, the idea of forever, um, which also is a very important idea in the poem Bright Star. Um, and the speaker then comes to the conclusion that this urn actually is just a cold pastoral. And it denies the kind of heat of humanity, breathing human passion far above. So although it seems to depict something warm, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, actually it doesn't provide any human warmth at all. It is merely cold and distant and kind of unengaged really with uh, the intensity of human passion. To Summarise then, the Grecian urn itself is a foster child of silence and slow time. It is a sylvan historian. It's cold, it's distant, it's eternal, and there's a sense of timelessness. And also depicting it as a historian. It's a kind of record of humanity. A cold pastoral, a cold record of humanity. The Grecian urn depicts on it human lovers in a state of wild ecstasy, just about to kiss, just about to have physical sensory experience. That is warm, intense, human. In the first three stanzas of the poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn, the narrative voice celebrates the state of the humans depicted on the urn as ideal, or at least seems to want to be depicting them as ideal. They're in the moment of ecstasy, never to decay as they cannot fade. They are forever young. In the language of Bright Star, this is a way to have perhaps steadfast love. Forever wilt thou love. It's almost a command, forever wilt thou love. You will love forever. So the narrative voice, after um, initially celebrating what the urn represents, seems to begin to find dissatisfaction. That in fact, the urn is all breathing human passion far above. And remember that in Bright Star, the star is in lone splendour hung aloft the night. So it's above the human. It's above the earthly. So although the urn depicts breathing human passion on it, 
The urn itself is removed and distant, like a star watching the happenings on Earth's human shores. It is cold and indifferent. And the speaker comes to question, comes to ask, it seems to me, where is the satisfaction in that? Forever warm and still to be enjoyed. And we note the importance of the word still here. Um, and the word still is also very important in the sestet of Bright Star. Still to be enjoyed. And this then sort of paradoxically means that if something is forever still to be enjoyed, it is never actually enjoying in the present moment. So seemingly paradoxically then, if the pleasure is forever to be enjoyed, then simultaneously it is never to be enjoyed. So going back then to the opening line of Ode on a Grecian Urn, which I said we should already from the opening be slightly aware that something is um, amiss. Thou still unravished bride of quietness. And here we have the two meanings of the word still. Still as in continuing. So it's been on the vase for a very long time but also still as in not moving. And movement is of course an essential part of life. Breathing, moving is an essential part of human life. The thing that we might notice about this opening line, thou still unravished bride of quietness, is that in order of course for a marriage to be official, consummation has to take place. A bride should be ravished. To be still unravished, this bride, suggests that what should have happened, what ought to be, hasn't been. That ravishing ought to take place. Uh, so from the opening line then, despite the narrative voice's attempts to convince himself of the more happy love, more happy, happy love depicted on the urn, readers should be aware that something is essentially wrong or at least essentially discordant. In some sense then we might think of the conundrum depicted in Ode on a Grecian Urn as being like the image of Joy's grape, which appears in John Keats's poem Ode on Melancholy, which was also written, as I've said, in May 1819. So the image of Joy's grape, and I think this is quite a useful kind of image to, to, to keep in mind when you think of the way that Keats thinks about his um, kind of central paradox that he's trying to work through, is that Joy's grape um, contains all the delight you can imagine, all the joy you can imagine is contained in this grape. It's juicy deliciousness uh, is everything that you want joy to be. But what is the point of merely having joy's grape at arm's length or just looking at joy's grape? If you've got this grape of joy here, what is the point of just looking at it? What is the point of having Joy's grape if it is forever to be enjoyed? At some point, one should, in the language of the poem, burst Joy's grape against his palate fine. At some point, you actually have to experience eating the grape. Otherwise, you won't know what the joy within the grape is. You actually have to enjoy the delights and joys of eating the grape, even though you know that the grape will then be gone. So how does all this relate to the poem Bright Star? Well, applying these notions to John Keats's Bright Star poem, the narrative voice seems to be wondering what is the point of the star's steadfastness if it is only ever distant and watching. 
if the star only watches the Earth's human shores, but does not engage with it. You know, is that the kind of steadfast love you want if it's distant and cold and removed? Ode on a Grecian Urn closes by raising the dizzying thought of forever, which Bright Star also engages with. Thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as does eternity, cold pastoral. And Keats returns to the puzzling idea of eternity in Bright Star and the oxymoronic closeness of forever and never, which seem to be completely distant. If something is forever, surely that's totally the opposite of it being never. And yet it seems that actually those those two are very, very closely related as Keats is teasing out. This is the teasing out of eternity. Um, the poem Ode on a Grecian Urn is about how art conveys human passion and emotion and the necessary conversion within art, whether on an urn or in a poem, of the momentary and transitory into the fixed and eternal. Whatever art form is being used, it is a fundamental conundrum, a fundamental paradox that if you were just trying to describe a breathing human moment of passion, if you write about it in a poem or if you create a, an urn with it on, you are converting the temporary into the eternal. And, you know, that Keats seems to be constantly asking whether art does this satisfactorily or not. Uh, and I think that Keats is asking similar questions in Bright Star. So you've got many layers of questions going on. You've got the, the, that kind of fundamental thought. Um, how do you take a small moment and hold on to it in some way in your kind of everyday life? But also how do you how do you do that in art? How do you do that in poetry? And what language do you use to describe it? Do you use romantic, sublime nature imagery? Or is there another language to use to try and capture these small, intimate human moments? So the poem Bright Star seems to question the usefulness of a kind of Wordsworthian poetry that focuses on the sublimity of distant nature rather than wondering at um, immediate breathing human passion. So Bright Star asks, how might poetry translate a reverence for nature? And, you know, we can see that the, the, this idea of reverence, a kind of religious reverence to some extent in the re religiously inflected language of Eremite, priest-like and pure ablution, in the octet of Bright Star. So how do you take those same feelings of kind of awe inspiringness and apply them to temporary human interactions? To run through the form of the sonnet very quickly. So Bright Star is a sonnet and it's a mixture of sonnet forms, the Petrarchan and the Shakespearean sonnet form. I've spoken before in another video on Charlotte Turner Smith and her sonnet written at the close of spring about how she combined the two forms and she tried to get the best out of the two forms. And Charlotte Smith is often referred to seen as a proto or pre-romantic poet. And in particular, her elegiac sonnets from 1784 um, where, and written at the close of spring is one of those sonnets, had a big influence on romantic poets, especially in her evolution of the sonnet form and trying to, to get the best of both worlds in having both the Petrarchan and the Shakespearean, which Keats does here, I think, in this poem. So how does he combine them? How does Keats combine the two forms? Well, in terms of the rhyme, it's a Shakespearean sonnet sometimes called an English sonnet. So the, the form of the rhyme uh, in this form of sonnet is that you have three quatrains, so that's four lines, a quatrain is four lines grouped together. And then you have a concluding couplet, so two lines grouped together. And the rhyme scheme is 
very sort of straightforward. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. But in terms of the overall structure of the sonnet, this poem, Bright Star, is Petrarchan, sometimes called an Italian sonnet. Petrarchan sonnets are made up of octets, so eight lines, and then you have a volta or a turn, so a kind of pause. Sometimes it's put into two different stanzas, sometimes it's all one stanza, but still there, there has to be that turn. Um, and then there is a sestet, which is six lines. So the, the conceit of a Petrarchan sonnet is that the octet establishes an idea or a thought, then you have this break, and then the sestet reflects back on and often challenges or questions or interrogates the certainty of whatever was outlined in the octet. So John Keats here in Bright Star retains the octet, volta, sestet form of the Petrarchan sonnet. There's a clear, clear volta um, between lines eight and nine, and the sestet very much develops what was um, outlined in the octet. Keats also retains the final couplet of the Shakespearean sonnet form. And what that does kind of traditionally is that it's supposed to bring some kind of resolution or conclusion. So there is a, an idea or a sense that the heroic couplet form brings a sense of completion. And I've spoken about that in another video that I did on heroic couplets. Um, and the idea that the heroic couplet is really a form to use if you want to bring kind of certainty, particularly to the, the end of a poem, because um, the neatness of closing on a heroic couplet, so on a rhyme kind of one after the other, brings a sense of resolution, or at least apparently brings a sense of resolution. And the diction here in this poem highlights the mixture of the two forms. So the opening line of the octet has uh, steadfast in it. You can see the development of steadfast. Then in the opening line of the sestet, you've got still, steadfast, still. And then that the steadfastness slips out in the opening line of the closing couplet and you just have still, still. So you can see in some sense the development of the poem just in, in that use of diction and how it interrelates there with form. So the mixture of the Petrarchan and Shakespearean sonnet form then allows for greater development within the poem. So the questioning mode of the sestet unsettles the apparent certainty of the concluding couplet here in this poem. If the speaker within the poem can say no after the pause of the volta, then why couldn't the reader or indeed the speaker within the poem pause and think no at the end of the poem. So the, the final couplet doesn't actually bring as, as great a sense of resolution as you might sort of think that it does. So after the volta, um, after the pause, the sestet opens no yet, which sort of qualifies the thought, qualifies the no and extends it, but it doesn't stop it. There's a, you might say there could be a perpetual sense of no, yet, no, yet, no, yet. That the, the no doesn't actually bring a sense of um, a final answer and just saying no. It's no, yet, no, yet. And that's the teasing out of thought that you never actually settle on a, on a no or on a yes. And the concluding couplet of Bright Star, which is accentuated, as I've said, in the rhyme of the um, closing couplet, the heroic couplet, and the rhyme of breath and death. So the rhyme seems to offer a pleasing concluding certainty, which you get with rhyme, but actually offers something far less settled. And part of the reason that it's less settled is because those two parts of the rhyme seem to be inherently contradictory. So it suggests that we humans should try to exist in the paradoxical state of embodying opposites at the same moment. So in the rhyme then you've got breath and death. The most 
tender breath should be, according apparently to the poem suggests, should be at the moment of death. And each then apparently kind of intensifies the other because breath is essential to life in breathing is a kind of fundamental part of obviously of being alive and so to contrast it then with so sort of brutally with the final word of the poem death brings them into conflict with each other you might say and this is a really essential Keatsian belief or doctrine that life is intensified by a present awareness of death, a kind of active present awareness of death. Not that death is some distant thing that happens way in the future, but thinking now of death intensifies whatever it is that um, brings you a feeling of life in this moment. So life is intensified by a present active awareness of death. Joy is intensified by a present active feeling of melancholy and we can see this um, idea of existing in this oxymoronic state in Ode, uh, Ode on Melancholy and in that poem which as I've said was written in May 1819 a few months before Bright Star and at the same time as Ode uh, on a Grecian Urn I in the very temple of delight veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine so even in the moment that you are celebrating or experiencing something delightful, you must revere and respect melancholy. So even in the moment that you are in the temple of delight, there is a shrine still in that moment to melancholy. And John Keats talks about existing in this oxymoronic state in his real life too. So in a letter from John Keats to Fanny Braun, who I already mentioned, his lover who he can't be with because uh, for financial reasons and because of, of health reasons too. So he writes to her in um, July 1819 on the 25th. So again, the same year, 1819, when he's thinking through all these ideas, particularly relevant, I think, to the sestet of Bright Star. So Keats said, I have two luxuries to brood over in my walks your loveliness, which we might think of as the temple of delight, and the hour of my death, veiled melancholy. Oh, that I could have possession of them both in the same minute. So that's kind of central, fundamental to Keats's thinking and the idea of possessing both those two extreme feelings, the kind of pinnacle of loveliness, the pinnacle of love uh, and death melancholy at the same minute in the same minute as I've said this idea of each feeling intensifying the other feeling because they exist at the same time but there's another thing I think that this quotation suggests which help might help us to understand bright star which is about wanting to choose the moment of death at a pinnacle of human happiness or loveliness or delight so in Ode on a Grecian Urn, the moment of wild ecstasy, of mad pursuit, the moment, the height, the pitch of love, of warm human love, had been petrified, had been ossified, had been converted into stone, you know, cold, hard marble. Later, still puzzling over that same conundrum how do you hold on to that moment of wild ecstasy in bright star the poet seems to be puzzling over that idea and perhaps um, suggests that rather than trying to hold on to that moment forever it would be better to die in that moment of wild ecstasy so instead of fixing it forever in hard marble, it would be better to simply die. That that would be the, the, the kind of the way to intensify that feeling to a pitch. Um, and you might think, for example, of Ode to a Nightingale, you know, now 
more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. This idea that Keats has it in this period of his life when he's thinking about the best moment to die and how to find the right moment uh, to die. And perhaps this would be it, you know, at a, at a moment of high human intensity and passion, perhaps that would be the best moment to die. A problem that the speaker is confronting within the poem Bright Star, the, one of the central paradoxes, is that he would like to stop all change, become unchangeable, to freeze things at one exquisite moment. But the speaker realises that doing so would be the opposite of actually living life. That life is change, that life necessitates change, that even as you lie on your lover's ripening breast, you know that decay is on the horizon. And given that you know decay is on the horizon, is it better just to die before decay happens? So turning now then to the poem Bright Star. And as a whole, the movement between the octet and the sesta, I think can be kind of summed up by saying that in the octet, the, the star looks, gazes on the earth. It is detached and watching. And in, this, in the sestet, in the second half of the poem, the speaker looks at, yes, but also wants to engage with his lover. He wants touching, he wants experience. And the poem asks, how do you convert the enduring timelessness of the star? How do you convert that to the temporary intimacy of experiencing time with your lover? Humans are not timeless. And how do you kind of cope? How do you cope with that thought, that ever present thought for Keats? You know, in some sense, you might see the star as being like the nightingale in Ode, uh, Ode to a Nightingale, in that the, the nightingale floats far above the earth, just as the star does, whereas the humans who are on the earth are aware um, of the weariness, the fever and the fret, here where, where men sit and hear each other groan. That, you know, the nightingale can escape or the star can escape the the kind of decay of humanity, but we are not symbolic nightingales. We are not the North Star. So how do we kind of cope with knowing that um, our time is temporary? So bright star, it's a, an apostrophe to the North Star, to the polar star, to the pole star. Would I were as steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendour hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart like nature's patient sleepless eremite the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors great sublime imagery here. We've got it all. We've got the sea, we've got mountains covered in snow, we've got moors, we've got stars. Beautiful sublime imagery. And the speaker desires the steadfastness of the star, but without the solitude. Would I were as steadfast as thou art. You know, I, I want my love to continue, not in lone splendour hung aloft the night. So I don't want to be alone though, like the star is. I don't want that solitude. Instead, the speaker longs for human connection with another. So this lone star is, uh, this star, lone star is um, personified. It's watching with eternal lids apart. It's like an observing artist. It's uninvolved in events. It's just eternally watching. 
And what is it watching? It's watching Earth's human shores. Which is really interesting because the the speaker of the poem then brings in the idea of the human. But it's a very disconnected idea of human. This isn't... Um, you know, watching humanity and the intricacies of, of what it is to be a human and, and love and think and feel and etc. It's thinking of the human in terms of Earth's shores. You know, kind of here is the star looking on Earth as a kind of whole with all humanity sort of distant and cold. I mean, like like the Chaldean shepherds that Wordsworth was describing earlier. So this star is like nature's patient, sleepless eremite. Patient, again, the idea of timelessness. It does not feel the pressure of time, which humans do. I mean, particularly Keats, who, you know, who had seen his, his brother die and knew that he was not well himself. So an eremite is a hermit or a recluse. Again, this idea of solitude, um, which the speaker is rejecting. The moving waters at their priest-like task. I think the idea of moving waters here is really interesting because you have the idea of movement, which you think of as being related to life. You know, living things move breathing and when you're lying on your lover's chest you can feel the movement of the chest but wa waters the sea is not a living thing so you've got a, a a kind of false living to some extent in this image of the moving waters it's a really interesting image i think um there so the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution, the idea of cleansing round Earth's human shores. And as I said, it's bringing in the idea of human, but human here is kind of oddly removed. A bit like moving waters sort of suggests life and movement, but the, the living is oddly removed. The living that goes on on Earth is oddly removed. So it's a reference to the human, but no engagement with the human, which is what the speaker longs for. Or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. And you might say here that, you know, this this new soft fallen mask doesn't actually mask anything. You know, from that position, from the star's steadfast, distant position, you know the mountains are still mountains even if they're covered in snow and if we compare the soft the two uses of soft we can also see some of the the difference so you've got a soft fallen mask which covers still the the kind of hard mountains the the softness of the snow is it's still cold because it's snow and it's still hard because it's covering mountains it's not it's not really very soft compared to the the touch of skin in the, the to feel forever its soft swell and fall the soft um, breathing of his lover so we've got an explicit kind of contrast between those two images in the use of the word soft so then we have a volta, the volta, we have the pause, we have the end of the octet and the beginning of the sestet reflecting back on the octet. No. So it seems to be a rejection of that. It seems to be a rejection of the, the cold hardness of this eternal distant star. No yet. But he still wants the steadfastness even as he's kind of rejecting the coldness of the image, he still wants the steadfastness, even though we're human, even though we know we're going to die, even though we know we're going to decay, even though we know that roses fade, even though we know all of that stuff, we, 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 we hanker after the steadfast. There's still something that we want to capture of the steadfast and that kind of cold, eternal impenetrability. There's something about it still that we hanker after no yet still steadfast still unchangeable that there's something desirable that we want in unchangeability 
pillowed on my fair love's ripening breast. And this is really important, this verb here. So a verb obviously is an action. My fair love's ripening breast. So the idea of ripening means that it's an action that's going on at the moment. So it, so it's not unchangeable. It is changing because it's ripening. Even at this moment that he's talking about wanting things not to change and he's lying on his lover's breast, that breast is in the middle of changing, in the middle of ripening as he's lying on it. It's bringing in the idea that decay is inevitable because obviously it's ripening, it will become ripe and then it will decay. That's, that is unavoidable. You can't, um, you can't get around it. Human flesh it, it decays. As the speaker says in Ode on Melancholy, this is beauty that must die. Beauty that must die. You know, this imperative, it must die. And even as he's hankering after unchangeableness and steadfastness, the speaker in using the word ripening knows that this is beauty that must die. To feel forever its soft swell and fall. Even as, as the speaker knows that decay is coming, it still wants to feel forever. Uh, but even again, this is still not unchangeable because there's movement here. The, the swell and the fall of the breathing to feel forever its soft swell and fall. And to some extent here, I think we can see this as a reference back to the idea of the moving waters or an oblique reference because the moving waters like a tide go in and out. They have a swell and a fall too. Like the breathing of the lover's chest, it has a swell and it has a fall and it has a swell and it has a fall. And this is an intimate human moment of connection to feel that, to feel forever this um, swell and fall. That's a very different image from the steadfast star that merely sees the moving waters and sees the tides come and go, but doesn't feel, doesn't feel anything about it. Awake forever in a sweet unrest. And that really essentially is the kind of position of, you might say, of the figures on the urn. Awake forever. <laughs> um, and this idea of sweet unrest is a, is kind of paradoxical because unrest is not sweet. Perpetual unrest just doesn't seem like it would be a sweet thing. Also, the idea of rest is a kind of euphemism for death, you might say. Rest in peace, you know, that, that, that kind of image that we have. So, awake forever in a sweet unrest, kind of paradoxically or kind of contradictingly seeming, brings together the, or brings to mind the idea of eternal life, which is another way of thinking about death. You know, the afterlife is, you know, you might conceive of as being the eternal life. Actually in saying awake forever in a sweet unrest only serves to highlight the inevitability of death in the human transitory world. Going into the next line, there's a beautiful paradox in unrest, still, still. So he's just said he wants to be awake forever in a sweet unrest and then to be still, still. That doesn't seem to make kind of sense as an image either. And as in the still, um, unravished bride in Ode on a Grecian Urn, there's two meanings of still here. So still as in continuing and still as in not moving. And I've talked about, you know, that how movement is brought into to the poem. So the idea of stillness then uh, is to do with death, is it? Um, you know, to be awake forever in a sweet unrest is uh, is a good 
thing the speaker wants, then what is it to be still, still in, in comparison? Is it an impossibility? So still, still to hear, we've got a human sense. So we had to feel earlier and now we've got to hear. So engaging with the sensory. Still, still to hear her tender, taken breath. It's a beautiful um, use of alliteration, tender, taken, and how you have to slow down to, to read that and kind of pause over that moment, just as you would, or just as the speaker does kind of in actuality when he's experiencing that, to hear her tender, taken breath. And so live ever or else swoon to death. So as I've said, this final couplet, breath and death, it kind of exposes the essential paradox of the position, which is that breath is the essence of life and death is the end of life or the absence of life. But at the same time, again, seemingly paradoxically, death is the moment of bringing about eternal life. You know, if, if you're thinking in a religious sense and there is religious imagery in the beginning of the poem, so is is death the kind of the boundary into the eternal life? And in that sense, is that the way that you can um, keep that the the moment of high passion and kind of bring it into eternal life? So on the urn, you have the figures just about to have this moment of ecstasy that they're in you know this moment of passion etc and they're um kind of frozen in that moment forever so instead of that which doesn't seem to be satisfactory in a number of ways what if at that moment of high passion that kind of the most intense moment of love you can imagine what if at that moment you die and that's the moment when eternal life begins so you've you've sort of begun eternal life in a in the highest state of kind of joyous feeling that you can imagine maybe that's the way to capture and retain and hold on to and and find some way of making that love steadfast by dying at that very moment. So on the one hand, the final line seems like a paradox, and so live ever. So, and so take that moment and that be the moment that you live forever. And then, or else, swoon to death. It seems like maybe the speaker or other critics have said that the speaker at this moment is kind of abandoning thinking about the paradox, kind of taking the, you know, it's just like, okay, I can't find a way to capture this moment forever. And so if you can't capture it forever, then at that moment, you have to kind of abandon life. And maybe that's the moment then to die. So there's that reading. And so live ever or else, you know, if you can't keep that moment and make that last forever, which the speaker apparently can't find a way of doing because you can't turn yourself into a marble man and keep it like that forever. So if you can't do that, you might as well just die. So you could read it that way. But then at the same time, as I've said, you might see that as the moment of death that then if you have the moment of death at a pinnacle moment, and that's when you start eternal life in the afterlife, Perhaps that's how you can keep that moment of passion kind of eternally alive to some degree. And that's a kind of paradox that you keep it alive through death, through the moment of death. And also that is a way to, I was talking earlier about how you bring in the sublime and the sublimity of um, nature and the great power, how you might combine that with human. And perhaps that is how you do it. So the way to bring those two things together is by uniting them at the moment of death. So you unite the human and the sublime 
at this kind of moment of transition because the sublime idea is that you're beginning everlasting life and the human is that you're you're doing that at this moment of kind of human intense passion thank you very much indeed for listening to this long discursive video on this kind of wonderful beautiful poetry of this period that's so kind of complex and and still I think teases us out of thought. Remember if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature then do subscribe and if you have liked the video then do press the thumbs up button it does help me out as I always say in YouTube's algorithm and I'd really really love to know your thoughts on on John Keats's paradoxical imagery and thinking and this kind of huge knot of issues that he's trying to wrestle with and trying to grapple with in this great year of his um, poetic composition in 1819. So do let me know how you interpret John Keats's paradoxical thinking uh, in his poem Bright Star. I'd love to know your thoughts. <laughs>